Daniel chapter 1, I, I love the book of Daniel. I say that about every book, of course, but I love the book of Daniel because Daniel is one of those characters that just really uh, encourages me and has influenced my life. He's one of two people in the scripture that there's no evil spoken of. And I'm, I'm not including Jesus in there. Of course, there was evil spoken of Jesus by evil people who wanted to condemn him. But as far as lifestyle and what they've done, no evil spoken of. And that was Daniel and another Old Testament character named Joseph. Uh, nobody could find things wrong with him. And that's one of the things in Daniel. People tried to uh, find ways to frame him up, defame him and... and uh, uh, heard his testimony, but they actually had to do it in uh, ways of the Lord. You remember they had to catch him in something spiritual. At one point, they decided, if you've read chapter 6, they decided that uh, to make a decree. They got the king to make a decree. They flattered him until he said, you can worship no one but the king for 30 days. And Daniel continued worshiping the Lord. So they went to throw him to the lions because he did what he always did. He could have rationalized it away and said, well, I'll shut my doors. I won't let anybody see me pray. But he didn't change his lifestyle. He did what he always did. And that's exactly what we're going to see this morning too. Um, as we turn to this prophecy of Daniel... By the way, prophecy is history in advance. I know your pastors taught you that many times over. And Jesus is the center of all prophecy. Uh, we read in the scripture, to him do all the law and the prophets testify. It's all about Jesus. As you go through the Old Testament, we see Jesus all the way through the Old as well as the New. So it's all about him. Most of Bible prophecy has been fulfilled already. The things of Christ coming, over 70% is already fulfilled, so we're just waiting for the rest of the fulfillment. Now, a lot of people have trouble with prophecy, especially outside of the Christian realm, and it's really what makes the difference in Christianity. If people say, how do you know the Bible is true? I can point to prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, and the rest of the world can't do that. You see, there's been other prophets, Gene Dixon and Edgar Cayce's and even other religious leaders that have made prophecies, but they haven't come true. And the Bible tells us if the prophecy isn't true, that's not a prophet from God. So only the Bible has these prophecies that are completely fulfilled. Uh, but people who have trouble with prophecy, people who are critics of the Bible, really have trouble with the book of Daniel. Because there's so many incredible prophecies in here, and, and it's too incredible for the natural mind to comprehend. Unless the Spirit's speaking to you, you have a tough time with this. So a lot, of, a lot of brilliant men have read the Bible cover to cover and never heard the voice of God because they wouldn't commit their self to him. You give yourself to him, he will speak to you. He will minister to you. He will teach you. So there's, there's many who feel that the prophets were uh, historians or novelists and, and just writing down the things they saw or the way they felt during that time. But I want to let you know that Jesus validated Daniel as a prophet. That's important to know. If Jesus said he's a prophet, then that's not a problem for me. I believe Daniel was a prophet and completely accurate. Uh, Jesus said it, I believe it. I also believe that we're living in times that are very similar to Daniel. When our nation has turned from the ways of God, from the things of our foundation, and there's always a price to pay. The nation of Israel went into captivity. There was three different captivities. We're going to see three different uh, times that the king of Babylon came and took people away from Jerusalem. He took the first contingency away and allowed them to maintain a puppet government as long as they would be nice and wouldn't rebel, but they rebelled. And so he took a second contingency away. We see Ezekiel goes during that second contingency. Daniel was in the first. And when they continued to rebel, he finally came and took the rest away and destroyed the city of uh, Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem too. So ongoing thing. But um, the world was given to idolatry. And even though the world was given to idolatry, even though the world had turned away from the Lord, Daniel had determined in his heart that he was going to serve the Lord and worship the Lord. Daniel was a, a spiritually minded man. Daniel was a man who separated himself from the rest of the world. And it's something that the scripture calls us to do today. But it's difficult because the rest of the world will encourage you to do what they're doing. You ever notice that the world today doesn't encourage you to do good things? They encourage you to do sinful things. They praise unrighteousness. They praise gay parades. They praise... Uh, 
fornication, homosexuality, drug use. They make a joke out of the whole thing. And if you abstain from it, they don't believe you. I have to tell you, I was going to go to work for a company a few years ago, and, and uh, they were going to run a background test on me and some drug testing. And they said, so how often have you used drugs? And I said, I, I never have. And they go, that's impossible. Everybody uses drugs. I said, not everybody. Me and some of my friends have abstained from that kind of thing. And they go, no way. And, and they even gave me a polygraph over this whole deal uh, because they couldn't believe that I've never been drunk or loaded. Uh, and I, I have to say, I'm not bragging or anything. That is the Holy Spirit of God that's kept me out of a whole lot of trouble. I had the opportunity, and if I'd yielded to my flesh, I could have. But it's by the Spirit of God. And, and I, I guess it's important to know that because there's a whole lot of people that are younger than me with peer pressure around them saying, give in, try it out. And here's a, a lame excuse a lot of people used to. How are you going to be able to witness to people unless you can identify with them? You know what? I don't have to murder somebody to witness to murders. Um, <laughs> I don't have to sleep with hookers to witness to hookers, okay? I don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. I have to follow the Word of God and be the man that God wants me to be. You need to be the man that God wants you to be, the woman that God wants you to be. So Daniel was that kind of man. He separated himself from the iniquity of his day. He determined, he decided to live differently than everybody else did. And he heard God's voice as a result of that. He spent time seeking the Lord and he heard God's voice. And I think we need to be like Daniel. We need Daniels in our day. We need to be spiritually minded. We need to walk apart from everything that's unholy. It's so easy to be unholy today. You flip on the radio, you flip on the TV, it's all over the place. People are sending you all kinds of things and unholy things or anything that would hinder our progress in divine things. So this first chapter of the book of Daniel introduces the moral condition of the land, the land of Israel. And it gives us an introduction to four devoted young men who made a resolution if you will, they made a decision to walk close to God in the midst of perversity. Because the nation was perverse, trials were going to come upon that nation. I want to suggest to you that because our nation is becoming more and more perverse, we will face more and more trial in our nation. And many of us are praying and seeking the Lord and thinking, well, Lord, why do I have to go through this trial with everybody else? Because when God judges the nation, even the righteous in that nation, like Daniel, like Ezekiel, like Jeremiah, all during this same time period, faced some of the persecution and punishment that was brought on because of the standard and state of the nation. So realize that we may face certain things as believers drawing close to the Lord, seeking the Lord, because our nation is not seeking the Lord or drawing close to the Lord. That's okay. God will still protect. God will still preserve. God will strengthen our witness through that. Having breakfast with a brother this week, and, and we kept talking about how this life is really like a boot camp. We're, we're called to an abundant life, not just an eternal life. There's that little dash between when we're born and dead, and, and that's to be an abundant life. But it's boot camp. Realize that we're in training. This isn't the end. This isn't, you know, Lord, I've got these trials and these bills and these weird relationships and all this stuff. It's part of the plan. It's part of the training. And Daniel and his friends realize that wherever God takes us, whatever happens, whatever situation we're in, we're going to ser serve the Lord. We're going to seek the Lord in all that we do. So um, these guys are, are given an opportunity to do otherwise, to do what the rest of the world would do. They could have made excuses. They could have rationalized. But why I am impressed, impressed with Daniel is the fact that he chose not to. Uh, he was set apart to God. He could do the popular thing. He could have done everything that the world was doing. But he decided to stand strong for God. <coughs> Excuse me. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So let's begin in verse 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Jerusalem, and he set siege against it. This is going to be the beginning of the first deportation. This marks the date of the first deportation. Again, Daniel goes in the first deportation. Ezekiel goes in the second. And the, oh, and by the way, Jeremiah stayed in Jerusalem. So God had people in three different arenas to do his work and do his will. Daniel was among the royal court. 
ministering to the government officials, the, the wealthy people of the community. Ezekiel's among the captives, ministering to uh, the rest of the community. And Jeremiah stays in Jerusalem to minister to those people that are still there. So God is working through three men at the same time in three different positions and places. But the Lord, verse 2, and I want you to mark this, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessel to the house of God, which he carried to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. What I want you to pay attention to and mark here is the Lord gave Now, I know a lot of the Jews were thinking, we're God's people. Nobody can take us. Nobody can destroy our temple. And they were kind of shocked when they got carried away. Well, how did this happen? God gave you into their hand. He made a promise years earlier to uh, Moses through the law. He said, if you will be obedient to me, I'll give you all kinds of things. Houses you didn't build, fields you didn't plant. I'll prosper you. I'll take care of you. But if you turn away from me, I'm going to take you away from that land. They turned away from the Lord, and he said, you're leaving. You're going out of here. He gave Judah into captivity, just as he said he would previously, through Isaiah and through Jeremiah. And when God makes a promise, he keeps it. God gives his word, he keeps it. So he removed the people from the land for a couple of reasons. Two main reasons. Number one, sabbatical year. Do you remember that part of the law? Every seven years, the land was to lay fallow. It's to rest. Uh, You weren't to do any planting, any plowing. You could eat whatever grew wild. But they had denied that. They'd forgotten the sabbatical year. They'd done it for 490 years, and nothing happened. God didn't punish. God didn't uh, starve us or anything like that. We got away with it. Sometimes God is very gracious, very lenient, and we get away with certain things and we think, well, God doesn't care. God doesn't know. We see that specifically in the book of uh, Judges with Samson. You remember he was a Nazarite. He wasn't supposed to drink strong drink. He wasn't supposed to touch dead things and he wasn't supposed to cut his hair. Well, I know at those Philistine parties, they were not drinking Kool-Aid or fruit punch or something like that. He got involved in the world. But nothing happened. He thought he was okay. We read that he killed a lion and went back to check out the dead body and even pull a honeycomb out of a dead animal to eat it. He touched a dead body. He wasn't supposed to. But nothing happened. He was sure he was getting away with it. And that's why finally with Delilah, when he gave in and and compromised completely and said, cut my hair off, he thought that nothing would happen. But God draws the line. God has a limit. So these people had not kept the Sabbath year. They owed God 70 Sabbaths. So he removed them from the land for 70 years. The land was going to have its Sabbath. The land was going to have its rest. That's one of the reasons. You've profaned my Sabbaths, he says in the book of uh, uh, Samuel, or Ezekiel, excuse me, chapter 22, verse 8. They'd broken God's commandment for too long. The second reason was that for years... They had been practicing idolatry. When they came into the land, you remember under Joshua, God told them to destroy all the idols, remove all those things, but they didn't. And they began to practice the things that the people there were practicing. (coughs) I think it's those burritos you were talking about. (laughs) But uh, uh, for years, idolatry had gained on them. And an idol is anything that you would put before God. So God sent them to Babylon, home of idolatry, that they might learn to loathe what they had learned to love. He, he uh, took what uh, they had because they did not serve him first. Verse 3, the king spoke to Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, his chief officer, and that he should bring in certain of the children of Israel and of the king's royal seed and of the nobles. So he'd instructed this man to choose out young men, teenagers who were coming into the country. In verse 3, we see that Daniel's of the royal seed of Judah. He was a part of the royal family in Judah, but God called him to witness to the royal house of Babylon, another uh, royal family. So God's setting up circumstances to put his men in place to minister. And, And from the flesh point of view, these guys are prisoners. Even though they'd served God faithfully, They're now reaping the punishment of the nation. But from the spirit point of view, God wanted a man that he could put into a place to be able to witness 
to a Gentile king and a Gentile court. God knew that they needed to hear his word, and so he put somebody who was influential to speak to those people at that time. He knew that there would be somebody in that kingdom whose heart would be soft towards him, and he sent a man to minister to him. So Daniel's there. Daniel could have thought, oh Lord, why did I end up here? Oh Lord, why did I end up in prison? Oh Lord, why did I end up being a eunuch? You know, all these kinds of things. But he knew that God had a purpose. God had a plan. He believed that no matter what situation he is. So here's the kind of people they were supposed to get. Youth in whom there was no blemish, fair to look upon, skillful in all wisdom, skillful in knowledge, understanding science and discerning in thought, such as had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace, whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. We want to put them in our educational system. We want them to learn our language. We want to assimilate them into our society, our culture, our structure. And this was to be a three-year training program. It's almost like going to college for free, except no summers off, right? You're going to go for three years. You're going to be trained intensely in all these things, kind of a cultural exchange program. They were going to have some special privileges. It's an all-expenses-paid trip to college in a foreign country. Now, among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Are you familiar with those names? Mishael, Hananiah, Azariah. I, I kind of laugh at this all the time because nobody remembers those names. Instead, what do they remember? You know? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why do we do that? I, I know there was a popular song a few years ago about that, but I like their Hebrew names better. They're biblical names that represent a stand with God. The, the Babylonian names do not represent God at all. They represent idols and false gods. But... Uh, it was part of the assimilation process. Let's change their names. Let's change their culture. Let's absorb them into the way we do things and our lifestyle, and they can live like us. But here's these four guys, and we don't know how many guys were chosen altogether. Uh, there might have been a good number, but out of this number, four men stand out. The rest are forgotten. No library on earth, no history book anywhere can give you the names or their number. Well, why these four men? Why do these four guys stand out? Why are they here? Because in a day when everything else seemed against them and there were no human helpers to turn to, these men were determined to be faithful to God, obedient to his will, regardless of the cost. We see that in chapter 3 when Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael are thrown into the fiery furnace. We see that in chapter 6 when Daniel's thrown to the lion's den. No compromise. That was their goal. That was their passion. Even today, the lives that really count are not the ones who go along with the crowd, uh, but those who are determined to stand for Christ regardless of the crowd, no matter what everybody else is doing. So these godly men went into captivity. Why? Because, again, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, Matthew 5, 45. And we live in a world caught by sin, and we bear the penalty of the burden of sin. I did not eat off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and neither did you, but we're still facing the penalty of that, aren't we? The weeds and the thorns and the thistles and earning the bread by the sweat of our brow. There's a consequence to sin, always a consequence. And uh, through Jesus, we can learn to be overcomers. We can have an abundant life. Isaiah 43 verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. I don't know about you, but when I get into trials, I want out now. Lord, get me out. And the Lord's often response to me is, I'll take you through the flood. I'll take you through the fire. I don't want to go through the fire, Lord. It's hot. I could get burned. I know but I'm going to temper you there. I'm going to strengthen you there. I'm going to teach you there. I love the teaching. I love the lessons. I love looking back and going, wow, look what God has done. I hate the beginning of the trial though, don't you? I, I don't want to face that. My flesh does not like those kinds of things. But the reason is God wants to get rid of my flesh. He wants to take those things away. I believe sometimes we suffer so that we may minister to others 
that are suffering. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 said, Blessed be the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of miracles, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we might be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted. I have a hard time identifying with some people. I have people come in who want to, uh, they're going through a situation with cancer. Well, I've never had cancer. I've talked to a lot of people with it, but, but I can't say, I know how you feel, because I don't. I've never had it. I can pray for them, I can be compassionate for them, but I don't know how they feel. Now, I did have a woman who came into my office, and she had a one-month-old granddaughter who was in the hospital with a heart problem. I could identify with her. I could say, I know how you feel, because when my son was born, he had a heart problem. I knew exactly what she was going through, and I could identify with her. I was able to give comfort with the comfort I'd been comforted with because I'd been through that same kind of trial. I knew the pain that she felt, and I could pray with her. Well, these four men are given their different names in verse 7. It says, "In Unto the whom the prince of the eunuchs, the chief of the officers, gave names unto them. He gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. This is part of the enemy's strategy to conform the world is trying to mold us into its image. I don't know if people do this anymore. Maybe some of the older ladies will remember jello molds. You used to pour your jello salad in there and you'd plop it over and the, it, your jello would look like a star or something like that, whatever the mold was. Well, that's what the world's trying to do. Mold us into its image. That's what we're told in Romans 12.1. Be not conformed to this world. That word conform means don't be molded into the image of the world. What's the image of the United States? I suggest dollar-mad sex chasing. That's the image of the United States. I had uh, some friends that were missionaries in Libya for a little while. And uh, part of the way they got to witness to people, it took a long process, but they brought the Jesus movie with them. And they'd gotten to talk to some students there, some Libyan students, and they said, do you guys like movies? And they're like, oh, yeah, we love movies. And they go, do you like Christian movies? Oh, those are the best movies. And they're thinking... You like Christian movies in a Muslim country? What Christian movies have you seen? Oh, we've seen Rocky in terms of endearment. And, and the thing is, that's representative of our country. And they've heard that our country was a Christian country. So to them, those were Christian movies. Do you want your kids to become Christians? No, no. In those movies, we see lying and cheating and murder and adultery. We don't want to be a part of the Christianity, but they sure do make good movies, you know? misrepresentation kind of thing. But conformity is the strategy. And this chapter depicts an attempt of the world to squeeze their captives, Daniel and his friends, into their mold to assimilate them. And we do become like the people we spend time with. Some of you maybe have been in the trades, carpenters or painters or plumbers. There's special language that goes with it, isn't there? There's little things you say that that are tricks of the trade, or you can ask for a certain tool or a certain piece of equipment or material, and, and nobody else would know what you're talking about. I, I did some painting for a while. Anybody that's a painter knows what holidays and alligators are. But I, I would guess that the rest of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about in painting. Where's an alligator when I paint? Does it come out of the can? <laughs> there's, there's little things that you say. We become alike when we spend time with certain people. And uh, if you spend time around certain trade people, you can learn tricks of the trade. Husbands and wives become like each other. They pick up certain speech patterns, certain characteristics. I love the fact that when a couple has been together long enough, they don't even have to say certain things. There's looks that mean things, right? There's a look that says, we've got to get out of here. <laughs> We've been here long enough. There's a look that says, don't you dare buy that. You know? There's all kinds of things that we, we know because we've spent time with each other. If you spend your time watching certain television programs or reading certain types of books and magazines, you will pick up some of the characteristics of those people. Here's the great thing, though. When I spend time with Jesus, I don't rub off on him. He doesn't become like me. I become like him. And that's what's happening here. This assimilation would begin by trying to dull their spiritual senses. Uh, second, by changing their identity to fit the mold of the world power. So they were going to be offered food. 
the king's delicacies. We're going to give you the best food we've got. But what do we know about Babylon? We know it was a city given to idols. What do we know about the food? Much of the food, especially the king's food, would have been food offered to idols. Okay, and this was offensive. But uh, meat, meat food that's been offered to Babylonian idols and to eat this food would be seen by some as participation in the Babylonian worship and uh, pagan Babylon god. And so in providing these delicacies, the Babylonians were subtly causing a compromise situation for these young Jewish men. Uh, we're going to feed you food off the diet. You know you're not supposed to eat that. But that's what we got, and that's what we're going to give you. And uh, it was kind of getting the foot in the door in the compromise. Compromise doesn't happen overnight. You don't wake up one morning and go, I think I'm going to backslide today. I guess I'll just go out and sin. It's gradual. And this was the way to get the foot in the door. Second effort, again, to assimilate these young men into the Babylonian world system was to change their identity, to get them to be associated with the Babylonian world, with the system of Babylon. Daniel means God is my judge. They changed his name to Belteshazzar. It means whom Bel favors or Bel's prince, one of their heathen gods, right? Hananiah, and, and you'll see why I like these names better than the other guy, the guy's names, the other names they gave him. Hananiah means beloved or favored of God. You, you got a kid or a grandkid coming. These are some great names. Favored of God. Well, he changed his name to Shadrach. Shadrach means illuminated by the sun god. Michel. Michel means who is like God. And so they changed it to Meshach. Who is like Shaq? Shaq was the moon goddess, or the goddess of love, like the, the Greek Venus. Azariah means the Lord is my help. And they changed it to Abednego, servant of Nego. Nego was the fire god. So uh, instead of being a servant of uh, the God of Israel, we want you to be a servant of the fire god. And that's why I don't. I like the Hebrew names much, much better than the Babylonian names. So I prefer to call them by their godly names. Here's the thing. They could change Daniel's name, but they couldn't change his nature. Uh, the God of the world, this world who's behind this strategy to conform people to the ways of the world, Satan wants to enslave people in the world system. Well, why do people spend their lives working for their families rather than spending time with their families? I like it when... when Pastors like Reuben and Virginia are able to take off and spend time together. It's to strengthen their marriage. It's to strengthen their family. And Roman was reminding me, yeah, we used to take all the kids down there and we'd have time at the beach just as family. And he said, now we're going to let them be there together, mom and dad. <laughs> the kids will, kids will hang out. But that's important to do those kinds of things because people spend so much time being busy with work. I think a, a great part of the problem in our society today was after World War II, both parents began working. Nobody was raising the kids. The kids rebelled, and, and we wonder why. We bought everything for them. Yeah, but you were never there with them. You can give people everything they want. Uh, marriages suffer from this kind of thing. What, I, I have guys come in all the time. What did she want? I worked three jobs. I bought her a new car. I gave her a beautiful house. Were you ever there? No, I was working. Maybe they wanted to see you. More than the stuff. Four men living in one of the most corrupt kingdoms ever known stood against the evil of the kingdom. Men whose names had been changed so that they were labeled as servants of heathen gods. Interesting, they didn't lead a riot. Uh, they just stood firm for the living God. Daniel didn't care if they changed his name. Uh, they could call him whatever they wanted. He knew who he was. <laughs> He knew who he stood for. Think about this too. The Holy Spirit had not been given in the Old Testament. This doesn't come till the day of Pentecost. We have the Spirit of God to give us strength in our decisions to make our stand. They didn't have any of that. This was personal determination that they had. And because of this, in the Old Testament we see that God poured his Spirit out on certain kings, prophets, and priests. Nowhere in here do we read that Daniel and his friends had the Spirit of God poured upon them. None of the power that we have available today. They didn't have the down payment of salvation that we received. Nothing tells us that any of these men received any special empowering, but they were resolute. They were determined to serve their God above all. Committed men, and God honored their commitment. Verse 8, 
Daniel, and here's, here's the key to this whole chapter, Daniel purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's food, nor with the wine which he drank, and therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs or the chief of the officers that he might not defile himself. I think this is one of the greatest verses in the whole Bible. Purpose of heart. What the Babylonians attempted to do is, is not unlike what happens throughout history, and again, it's happening in our world today. Forces that are trying to uh, assimilate uh, the best resources of the world to support their cause. The world is always trying to squeeze people into its mold uh, so it can further its purposes. And since Satan is the god of this world, to be conformed to this world is to be a tool in Satan's hand. Daniel, Hananiah, Me uh, Mishael, and Azariah were introduced as sons of Judah. And these young men represented God even in captivity. Now, how could they respond in this situation? Daniel purposed this in, in his heart. He wouldn't do anything to defile himself. Sometimes when people are away from home, and maybe you've seen this, maybe you've done this, you know, I'm not in my city. Nobody knows me. I can act out and be rude to waitresses and do strange things because nobody will know. The, the uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas mentality, you know. I can go crazy here and nobody will know. But these guys decided wherever I am, God's there, God knows, and must serve God. He wouldn't defile himself. And uh, no one's around, you know. I, I can watch strange things on the hotel TV because nobody knows. It won't be on my home cable channel and won't show up on the bill there kind of thing, you know. And uh, Daniel knew that God would know and he wouldn't compromise his faith. And this is a test of true faith. Do you act in private the same way you act publicly? Or are there two different people there? Daniel would act privately, and Daniel would act in, a, in another world the same way he would act in Jerusalem. He was going to be in Babylon just like he would be in Jerusalem, serving his God. He was faithful. He was not going to compromise with the world. Daniel purposed in heart that he wouldn't do any such thing. He had a heart relationship with God, just like Joseph that I mentioned, who did no wrong, served the Lord, even though he was in prison, even though he'd been accused of rape, even though he was accused of so many other things, Joseph determined to serve the Lord no matter what. He could have given in, but he didn't. So this is where the battle begins. It's in our heart. That's what the enemy would like to capture. And in the heart of Daniel, he knew for certain, God is my judge. No matter what they call me, God is my judge. And he answered to God. That was his primary concern. So the Bible's clear on the response of believers towards the world. It's always going to be tension. There's always going to be conflict between believers in the world. In fact, if there's not tension between you and the world, you might want to question your walk. How come the world likes me? How come I seem to flow with everything they're doing? Why aren't they upset with my stand with Christ? Are they suddenly all Christians? No. Maybe they don't know you're a Christian. Maybe there's no clear commitment there. So why am I getting along so well with the world? Am I fitting into the world? Have I been molded like them and don't even know it yet? Don't compromise. If you're getting along just fine with the world, you need to present yourself to God and make sure that there's no breaches. Nothing needs repair. And I like this. Despite the situation, despite the name change, these young men could have been considered lucky. You know, the majority was put into concentration camp type situations with Ezekiel. You guys get to live in the palace. You guys get to have nice rooms, nice clothes, nice food. You're fortunate. Even though there's a, a war going on, even though we've been captured by the enemy, you're living pretty well. You're doing pretty good. You might even say by world standards, they had it made. But Daniel wanted to obey God rather than man, just as the apostles of a later day. He would stake his life on this principle. And again, chapter 6 is testimony to that. He would stake his life on his belief in God. And so did his friends. Their furnace is the testimony in chapter 3. God knew that, or excuse me, Daniel knew that the king's meat was probably offered to idols, or it may have been swine or it may have been strangled. All these things were illegal to him, forbidden by the law of God. The king had given orders, and it might seem like there's no way out. What well, if we just fast or call a hunger strike or something like that, stir up a lot of trouble? Um, 
you know, we don't really have a choice in this matter. And it could be argued, well, we're not responsible. God put us here. This is the food they gave us. We may as well go ahead and eat it. But uh, they saw it as a trial of faith and they looked for a solution. They wanted to keep themselves from idolatry. They wanted to be as particular in Babylon as they would in Jerusalem. So they sought to glorify God, being subject to his word, even though they were captive in an oppressive country. So to many Jews, this might have been a trivial matter. Oh, Daniel's just being nitpicky about the food, you know. Um, I think it shows us a great biblical principle, that principle being God wants us to be faithful in the small things. If we can handle the little things, he'll give us bigger things. There's nothing that we can look at and go, oh, it's no big deal. It's all a big deal to God. It's all important in our training. Faithful over a few. You remember the men with the talents? Faithful over a few, I'll make you ruler over many. But it's the little things that make the difference. Many of us are willing to do great things for God. Are you willing to do little things for God? Lord, I want to preach to the multitudes. Will you pick up cigarettes in the parking lot? Will you change diapers in the nursery? Oh, Lord, that's the little stuff. I want the big stuff. Be faithful in the small things. The one who honors God by paying attention to what others would call minute details, I believe, is the one that's most likely to be used in greater things. And I think it would be well for us to imitate Daniel here and purpose our heart that no matter what, we stand for God. The early Christians sought to do that. Acts 11.23, cleave to the Lord with purpose of heart. Good verse. So there are believers trying to live a set-apart life. Unfortunately, oftentimes they parade their holiness like Pharisees. I'm more holy than you, you know. Do you tithe of all that you possess? Are you at church on time every Sunday? Have you served in the Sunday? You know, they can become really self-righteous and drive you a little crazy. You know the people I'm talking about. <laughs> Daniel set up his standard for himself. This is what I'm going to do. I'll pray for you guys. You do what God wants you to do. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I don't have to parade it. I don't have to proclaim it to anybody else. The world doesn't even expect this standard of me. I expect this standard of me because I'm a servant of God. This is my choice. And I'm going to maintain a position of separation, even though I'm in the home of idolatry. And so he courteously and very humbly made his request. Look down at verse 9. And it says, Now, God had brought Daniel into favor. I like the New King James better. God had granted Daniel mercy and compassion in the sight of the chief of the officers. This is God's grace in action. Uh, why do you think this guy favored Daniel? Why do you think this guy was merciful to Daniel? I think he saw something different, something special in these young men. Perhaps, and this is just my suggestion, perhaps it was the abiding presence of God. These guys were different. They weren't making demands. They weren't causing trouble. They just asked to have some different food. And Daniel knew that while he was in a foreign land under foreign worldly masters, uh, nothing could change who he really was or worked or lived for. Daniel knew that God was at work behind the scenes. And this is a message for every one of us. Go through hard times and confusing times. And when we're confronted by the world, and uh, for those upon whom the world has taken aim to try and cause you to compromise, Daniel didn't compromise because he relied on God and was faithful to honor and work through his faithful servant Daniel. Because Daniel purposed in heart to remain true to God, God was free to act on Daniel's behalf. Daniel knew who he worked for, so to speak. Uh, he took orders from his boss. That's true of us, too. I may work for a boss in the world, and I will do what he wants me to do, insofar as it doesn't compromise with the boss that's over him that he may not know. Listen, on the phone calls, you got to lie a little bit and tell him, hmm, I'm sorry, can't do that. Well, tell him this, hmm, that's not the truth. I can't do that. Could cost you your job. So be it. I serve my God. He's asked me to do certain things. He's set certain standards. I'm happy to work for you. I'm happy to do what you want. I just cannot compromise my standards with my Lord and Savior. Makes a difference. Makes a huge difference. The New Testament tells us it's important for believers to know who they work for. Uh, the one who 
works out the circumstances and consequences for obeying him. We're called to serve a living God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Colossians 3.17 Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then down verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. But if we conform to this world... Uh, it, it, in other words, we're not to in, conform to this world because God's our employer. We don't do what the world does. So the proper response to the world, God shows us through the life of Daniel. Verse 10, he said, The prince of the eunuchs, the chief of the officers, said to Daniel, I fear the Lord my king who's appointed your food and your drink. Why should he see your faces sad in comparison to the other youth, which are your age? Then you'll make me endanger my head to the king. Look, this is the king's program. He set it up. And, and if you guys end up looking sickly or something like that, I'm going to be in trouble for not feeding you, for not taking care of you. You're putting me in a dangerous place. And instead of compromise, instead of Daniel going, okay, I'll eat the food, he, he confronts the world, not in a self-righteous or an arrogant way, but in love. He cares about this man. Daniel told this man, Ashpenaz, this servant, head of the eunuchs, that he and his friends didn't want to defile themselves with the king's delicacies. And this kind of sent a shiver up this guy's spine. You could endanger me. You could get me in trouble. He must have thought, Daniel doesn't know the king like I know the king. Daniel doesn't know how violent this guy can become. Daniel doesn't realize he can say off with your head in a moment's notice, and it happens. We, we see that happening later on, don't we? Chapter 2, actually, the king is mad at all of his counselors, and he says, just kill them all. And the army began to go house to house, killing all the advisors of the king. And it was Daniel who said, what's the rush? <laughs> what's going on here? I wasn't even called in. Daniel would not isolate himself from the lost world. Daniel's heart was like God's heart for the lost. God loves those who are in the lost world and has a desire that they would liberate themselves from sin. So Daniel put himself and his three friends in a position to be light in a dark world. Daniel was not arrogant. Daniel was not outright oppositional in his nonconformity, but rather he was graceful, he was gentle, he was compassionate, he exhibits meekness, he exhibits self-control, and uh, the man whose heart belongs to God has a heart for people, the lost people of the world. The Babylonian system had tried to influence him, now he was going to influence them. He wanted to show them something different. Uh, in the New Testament, we're told in 2 Corinthians that we're ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5.18 Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled. Isn't that a neat verse? I'm an ambassador. You ever thought about being an ambassador to another country? We are. We're, we're not merely citizens of the U.S. We're citizens of heaven. I've got dual citizenship. I always wanted that when I was younger. Why can't I have dual citizenship? You do. And what does an ambassador do? Represents their country. I am from a country where there's no sickness. We don't have to have uh, special government health care. <laughs> we don't have any hospitals, by the way, because nobody ever gets sick. Oh, we don't have any taxes. You see, the government there is able to take care of itself. They own everything anyway. Uh, I would like you to visit my country. By the way, I know I've come to visit your country here in America. I, I would like to visit your leader, your president. He's much too busy to see me. I'm not important enough. He doesn't have time for me. I'm merely an ambassador from another country. But if you would like to visit my country, I can introduce you to the king personally. And he'd be happy to talk with you anytime, anywhere, about anything. Isn't that an amazing thing we've got? We're ambassadors. Think about that. We need to be ready to give a defense for what the Lord has, has given us. So Daniel's an ambassador to God in the dark part of the world. Daniel said, verse 11, to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, continue to use their Hebrew names, prove your servants, I 
ask you for 10 days, let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. I'm not even going to get into the whole thing about where some people try to use this and say, oh, you see, Daniel became a vegetarian. That's not what it's saying here. Okay, He's just saying, test your servants. See if what I believe isn't better than what you believe. Just, just test it out. I'm not asking you to do anything different in your life. I just want you to watch my life and see if there's a difference here. And so by asking the Ashpenaz to test them, he was confidently creating a situation that God would be put to the test. Let's see if my God will do what I ask him to do. An opportunity for God to reveal himself to his captors, these worldly captors. Uh, so this is Daniel and his three friends stepping out in faith and trusting God. And they were putting God to a test in a godly way. We're told in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So the Bible's filled with examples of those who extended their faith to the world. Do you remember Moses faced Pharaoh and told him what God would do? Joshua marched against Jericho in faith. Gideon faced the Midianites with only 300 men in faith. Elijah faced 450 prophets of Baal in faith. Huge odds. Daniel's facing the entire Babylonian kingdom in faith. And, and on and on, God uses those who are willing to step up in faith and be a visible witness to the lost world. And that's what Daniel wanted to do, be a visible witness. Check our countenance. Look at us. See how we look and feel after these 10 days. See if we don't look healthier than everybody else who's eating the king's meat. He made himself and his friends accessible. Look at the way we live and see if this isn't true. See if it's not different from the way you live. He exposed himself to public scrutiny in effort to give glory to God. That's hard to do, isn't it? That's what he did. Let's look at verse 13. Sometimes we get isolated. We remove ourselves from the world. No one can see your light. Jesus lets us remain in the world that we can be a witness to the world and influence it through the gospel. John 17. Verse 13 of Daniel 1. Let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat. As you see, deal with your servants. So he consented this matter. So I'm going to prove you for 10 days. It's a three-year process. 10 days isn't going to hurt him. This is a reasonable challenge. And at the end of the 10 days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than the children which ate the, the portion of the king's meat. So Melzar, the steward, took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink. And he gave them pulse, gave them permission to conduct themselves as they desired. God made a way out of the trial. God provided for them. And because of their carefulness to maintain a good conscience before God, these servants of God were given a spiritual enlightenment above and beyond all men. We see that they had understanding of spiritual mysteries that others failed to enter into. They knew more than all the soothsayers and prognosticators, Gene Dixons and Edgar Casey's of their time. God honored and used their faithful witness. God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams we read in verse 17. In other words, God took the initial step of faith and he built on it and made it bigger. And as we continue to study Daniel, we see these four were used in even greater ways. God not only honored their commitment. He gave them special skills and equipped them with talents that they would need to influence the world around them. Look at verse 18. Now at the end of the days when the king said he should bring them in, the prince of the eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king communed with him and among all that was found, none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, therefore they stood before the king. They became counselors to a foreign government's leader. How about that? And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better, not than just the other ones he'd brought in, ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. It's just as true today. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned, 2 Corinthians 2.14. God does not often impart his secrets to careless men and women, but to those who are devoted to serve him. Yeah, on occasion, he'll, he'll tell somebody something. Uh, there's exceptions, guys like uh, Balaam or Caiaphas, but it's for God's purposes to be fulfilled. But these cares are rare, cases are rare and extraordinary. 
Uh, Psalm 25, 14, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And just as Daniel and his three fans were found to be ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in the realm, our faithful witness will be used by God to show the superiority of our relationship through him. Uh, Roman encouraged you to see the movie God's Not Dead. If you haven't, it's a great movie that um, portrays this very thing. Somebody trusting God to confront the world, not in an egotistical way. He just took a stand because he wouldn't sign a piece of paper. And God used it and made a difference. And now he's using that to make difference in a lot of people. What makes you so different? That's what people should be asking you. If it hasn't happened to you in a while, check with the Lord. Why are you different? Why do you have peace when the world's falling apart? What, what's, what's with you? What have you got? People should be asking you that question. God wants to influence the world around us. And uh, he's not going to leave you out there hanging out by yourself. He calls, he equips, he empowers, and uh, he gives us his Holy Spirit. Each one of us has a gift of the Spirit. and We should be using it in the body of Christ. Verse 21, Daniel continued even to the first year of King Cyrus. You stand for God, he'll stand for you. God continued to use Daniel. And the principles illustrated again in the third chapter in the furnace, the sixth chapter in the lion's den. And in the New Testament, we read Jesus said the same thing. If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 and Luke 12, 8. We live in days when everything that was once important is looked upon now with indifference. The truth for which hundreds of martyrs have died and laid their life down is now considered hardly worth contending for. So many compromise in their schools and their jobs. We live in days when the claims of God set forth in his, forth in his word are openly, openly set aside. People will do the opposite. And they're set aside, unfortunately, by those who call themselves by the name of the Lord, Christian. Is it any wonder that false teachings and isms abound and the church seems powerless? The enemy's coming in like a flood and thousands are being swept away. First Timothy 1.19 says, By the putting away of good conscience, people make shipwreck the faith. Jude exhorts us, Contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. I think God's <laughs> smile meant more to Daniel than all the friendships or food or privileges that he could get in the world. Any worldly advantage was nothing compared to being right with God for Daniel. And I think that's an incredible lesson for us. The purity of heart and faithfulness to God, even in small things, comes before enlightenment of divine mysteries. Knowing God's will, God's way, and God's direction for you. Daniel becomes a serious reminder of the necessity of holiness. So this morning, I, I hope what you're going to take away from this is uh, some questions you need to ask yourself. Am I right with God in every area of my life? Am I compromising in any way? Am I trying to live that I honor him in everything I do? May we dare to be like Daniel and like his friends, purposed in heart, to stand apart from the world and its defiling ways, to be like Jesus. It's a growing process. But the Spirit of God is there to help us, to encourage us to stand strong in Him.